This is NC Spin, an unrehearsed discussion on issues of interest to North Carolinians. Now, here is your moderator, Tom Campbell. Welcome. You've heard and read the spin the media and the politicians have put on the issues of the day. To get the correct spin on what's going on in North Carolina, let's introduce you to our panel of experts. They include former House Speaker Joe Mavretic, Chris Fitzsimon from NC Policy Watch, John Hood from the John Locke Foundation, and Becky Gray from Carolina Journal and the John Locke Foundation. Welcome to this Memorial Day edition of NC Spin. This week we talk about a court restoring teacher tenure and other court cases, a new report showing North Carolina's unemployment rate has dropped again, and an interesting debate about whether the legislative building is truly the people's house. And, of course, we ask our panel to tell us something we don't know. Let's get started. Since taking the power of state government, Republicans have made significant changes in state laws, and many of them have resulted in lawsuits. We're beginning to get a scorecard of wins and losses, and we want to begin this discussion with Judge Robert Hobgood's ruling that overturns the law eliminating teacher tenure. Hobgood says it's unconstitutional. Becky, this is the same Judge Hobgood that put a hold on school vouchers, but his decision was later overturned by the Supreme Court. Senate President Pro Tem Phil Berger has vowed to appeal this ruling. Are we perhaps looking at another uh, instance where Hobgood's going to be overturned? We certainly could be. This is an injunction that Judge Hobgood has put in in the teacher tenure law, and Senator Berger has already said that he intends to appeal this. The General Assembly believed when they passed that law that it met, met all the constitutional muster. So this is a difference of opinion, shall we say. Judge Hobgood has already been overruled one time in the, as you mentioned, in the voucher program. But I think what we have here um, is an intent of the legislature legislature to see this thing through. And so even no matter what happens, what Judge Hobgood may decide or the appeals court may decide, the intent of the legislature is to change the teacher pay structure so that teacher, good teachers are paid for good performance to encourage that kind of behavior, to encourage good teachers to come into the teaching profession and to do away with tenure so we can get rid of bad teachers. That's the intent. They're going to continue to do that. Even if we see this revisited or visited once again in perhaps a different way during the 2015 session to any to fix any changes that may need to be done. But, but Chris, help me with this I, and make sure I'm right. Hobgood didn't say that they could uh, eliminate, they could not uh, eliminate uh, tenure for starting teachers right, or future. those teachers who had not already achieved tenure right, status. Right. That's, his, that, that's the, 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 his ruling was that they're taking unconstitutionally a taking, taking something away from the teachers who are under contract and had this career status. And I always think it's important we talk about this. We're not talking about tenure like they have in the university system. We're talking more about career status, career protections, due process when teachers are uh, need to be let go. And, and we've talked many times, and I know John has a different view of this, but I've actually talked to superintendents who have said they don't actually have a problem uh, getting rid of the teachers. A lot of them, when they're under disciplinary proceedings, resign. A lot of them leave and enter other professions. So I think there's, there's a big issue on the merits of the case, but you're right, Hobgood is the same judge. It's also important to point out his, what was overturned in the voucher case was an injunction stopping the program while the case was being heard. That case is still before him. Well, and this case is still before the court, is it not, John? This was only a, a partial decision so far as uh, the, the, the overall court case was concerned. Well, yeah, but both of those education issues are going to ultimately be settled by the Supreme Court, in my opinion. Certainly the scholarship voucher program will be ultimately resolved in the Supreme Court. I assume that whatever happens in Hopgood's level with the trial court goes to the Court of Appeals and presumably to the Supreme Court on the tenure decision. Uh, I disagree with the judge on this, but at least there's a little bit more of an argument that, than there is on the voucher case where I think there's really no way his original idea is going to be upheld by the Supreme Court since they have a precedent to work with. On tenure, however, the argument is, as you allude to, that there is a contract and that teachers have earned something and you're taking it away from them. Now that is not a cut and dried issue because on the other hand, uh, legislatures do have the authority to change all sorts of things that have to do with state employees and teachers and have many times over so the Joe, years. So Joe, what's going to happen to the, the four-year contracts and the $500 bonuses that the legislature had proposed offering? Uh, as, as Becky said, are they going to go through with this anyway? I think one way or another they're going to go through with it. This is more of a business approach to employees and uh, I really hope that uh, Hobgood gets overturned on this one. I think anything that simplifies the process to 
remove or replace low performing teachers helps educational outcomes and that's what we ought to be looking it's for. Worth, it's worth noting quickly that the 500 for teachers who take it, you know, the 25 percent of teachers get 500 is unpopular. There have been Republican school boards that have passed resolutions right. opposing that, yeah. so that part of it is very unpopular. Yeah, let, let, let's switch gears though and let's talk about the, the lottery and the school voucher situation. Uh, I guess the big question here is does the is it possible to put this thing into effect for the start of the next school year, Becky? I mean, look we're, what we've got to have happen here. We've got to have the lottery. The the parents that win have got to select the the private schools or charter schools that they want their kids to attend. Private, private, private schools private. that they want their mm -hmm. kids to attend. The school the private schools have to accept them. The state's got to get all of the book work done and get the money. Can this happen? Well, by? And, and not to mention, too, the burden that it puts on these schools. They have already are accepting students. They're hiring teachers. They're making plans for this year. So it places a burden on the schools as well as they're trying to make plans. We're certainly getting down to the short rows on this, but, just administratively. You're right. But keep in mind that a number of these schools, particularly the Catholic school systems in Charlotte and the Triangle and Down East and some of the uh, independent schools, have already had students approach them. They already have a sense of how many students they might be able to yep. take. So it's not like they've just been sitting around waiting to see what happens at the court level. They're acting pretty quickly here. Joe, on, on another case, uh, U.S. District Court Judge Thomas Schroeder said that uh, the General Assembly doesn't have immunity insofar as all of their correspondence regarding uh, the voter ID bill. Uh, we've now got several cases that have come before uh, the, leg uh, the courts based on legis how the, how the legislature doing here looks like the wins and losses are mounting up well i think it depends on the bent of the judge at whatever level uh... i think uh... judges who tend to be more liberal uh, are finding fault with what a Phil Berger said he was an activist judge well and i think in some ways that's actually true and I think that's one of the reasons why Republicans are doing their best to get judges with a different bias in place. Hmm. Tom, I think this speaks to, to, you know, as John mentioned, I think all of these cases probably, will, the likelihood is that they will go to the Supreme Court level, and at least through the Court of Appeals. I think this really reiterates how important those positions are, that we will be voting on some of those new members in November, and how important it is to pay attention to those races, and who we'll those be, people we'll are, and who's going to be in place. As we, as we go along. Remember, NC Spins now being aired on Time Warner cable systems throughout the state. In Raleigh-Durham, we want to remind our viewers that we're still aired on WRL at 6.30 a.m., Fox 50 at 8.30 a.m., and on WITN in Greenville, Washington, Newburn at 11. To learn the channel number and time for other can uh, Time Warner cable systems, consult the ncspin.com website, and you can watch us anytime you want on Time Warner On Demand or the ncspin.com website. We post each show on Friday, so view us anytime. Check us out at ncspin.com. When we come back, we're going to talk about low unemployment rates. NC Spin will return after these messages. It's important for farmers and hunters to work together. Farmers own a majority of North Carolina hunting land, and besides, we're often hunters too. We share the same North Carolina values that we'll pass on to future generations. We share the desire to enjoy the land and our leisure time. Together, we can respect the land our natural resources, and our privacy. Every year, North Carolina patients undergo 635,000 same-day surgeries. 72% of these surgeries are performed in our highest-cost hospital facilities, adding as much as $2,000 to every procedure. The state's outdated Certificate of Need law prevents competition from lower-cost, higher-quality same-day surgery centers, inflating health care costs, and limiting patient choice. Tell state lawmakers it's time to lower health care costs now. It's time to make a simple fix to an outdated law, increasing patient choice and lowering health care costs now. You can help. Visit reformconnow.com and tell lawmakers it's time for a simple fix to an outdated law. 
It's time to lower health care costs now. The best part about being a member of a Touchstone Energy Cooperative is that it's your Touchstone Energy Cooperative. Learn more about the power of your co-op membership at TogetherWeSave.com. North Carolina's Touchstone Energy Cooperatives, looking out for you. We now return to NC Spin. Once again, North Carolina's unemployment rate dropped in April. It was 6.2%, the lowest in six years, and by the way, below the national average. But does this show that the economy is truly getting better and we're finally creating more jobs? Or is this reading artificial because it fails to reflect all those who dropped out of the job search? And how does it affect those who are filing to receive new unemployment claims? Let's get our panel's reaction. Joe, NC State economist Mike Walden says that a strong growth rate would be uh, for jobs would be 2.5 percent. And last year, ours was 1.8 percent. So the question is, should we be more concerned about the growth rate, the unemployment rate, or some other indicator? I think we ought to be concerned with two other indicators, and that's all for the general public. The first one is a participation rate, which is the number of people that are working or are looking for work divided by all the people who are eligible to be working. In North Carolina, that runs somewhere between 62% and 68%. We're down at the lower pieces now. The other thing is the average wage in North Carolina, because what the average wage in North Carolina tells you what your education system is doing. And in North Carolina, for the last 30 years at least, we have been in the bottom half. Interesting. That's so, all I look at. So it's important to note that Mike also said that the late, latest job report was an excellent report. And he's right. It clearly was an excellent report. What he's saying, and he's absolutely correct, is that in previous economic recoveries, in previous e economies for North Carolina and the rest of the country, you had much more rapid job growth. But that's not happening this year across the country. Now, North Carolina is still doing better, in the, according to the latest jobs report, better than the national average at the 1.8. But that's not as good as it should be. But this is a national problem. It's not limited to North Carolina. Chris, we gained 15,000 jobs in April, according mm -hmm. to the report. Uh, are, are these... Uh, sort of minimum level kinds of jobs or are they good jobs? I mean we were told that a lot of the jobs were in leisure and hospitality uh, and in professional and business services. Well I think it's a mixture but we are creating more low wage. We're replacing what were middle class and upper middle class jobs in many cases with low wage jobs and that's happening all over the country not just in North Carolina. This is a mixed jobs report just like all of them are mixed jobs report. I'm, I'm always amazed that people who are saying this shows that North Carolina's economy is booming or we're doing, doing all these great things but when the national unemployment rate falls, somehow it's a, it's a bad economy. People are trying to have it both ways because different people control both, both governments, um, different political parties. It is clear that people are leaving the labor force. It is clear that people have given up work. But it's also clear that some jobs are being created. And how could they not be? Remember where we were. We were in the middle of the worst recession in our lifetime, the worst recession since a great, reset, since a great depression of the 30s. So clearly there was going to be a recovery. The question is, what kind of jobs? We still don't know. Too many of them are low wage. How fast and how, how, how the rest of the country is doing? Thank you. There's another aspect of this that, that has gotten zero media place, as far as it's concerned, and that is that the people who are filing new unemployment claims for benefits uh, beginning in July are going to see those benefits go down and the number of weeks that they can receive them uh, go down. Uh, why isn't this being talked about more? I have no idea why it's not being talked about anymore, but you know, when those unemployment benefits are cut, what we've seen across the country and here in North Carolina, when the benefits are rolled back, people go back to work. They accept jobs that perhaps you know, they might not have if they were dependent on the unemployment benefits. They go ahead and go back to work. It's easier to find a job once you're going back to work. Once you, when you have a job, it's easier to find a job. Um, the unemployment rates, you know, we started this just three, four years ago. We had the fifth highest unemployment rate in the country. Now we are among the best. Our recovery is faster than the rest of the country. So I think clearly we're doing something right. We also had a $2.8 billion debt that we owed the feds. And according to Dale Falwell, who's the SC uh, uh, Secretary, Deputy Secretary of Commerce, uh, we've reduced that now down to 1.1 billion. That's good news. Isn't yes, it? it is good news. And and to go back to the initial part of this of this topic, 
Uh, the 5th District Fed in Richmond probably does as good a job as any Federal Reserve in the country in identifying trends within our several states. And when I talk about participation rate, uh, I get that from the 5th District. And for the viewers of this show, I would suggest that they learn a whole lot more because it eliminates the kind of discussion that we had here. You about send me a lot of that information. I know that. And it's just Quite fascinating. Good. And it's important to remember that we don't have to guess about, well, are there discouraged workers and how many of them there are and what are they doing? The, the federal government measures that. Now, it doesn't measure it every month because the sample size isn't large enough. But for the most recent set of data, we, we know how many workers have dropped out of the labor force or discouraged. It's so about 30,000. It's our not a large number. All of this, very I quickly. think go to participation rate instead of all these unemployment numbers. Okay, but I mean, what's the bottom line? Is, are we doing better? Are we doing worse? We're, do, we're, doing a, we're doing a little bit better. We're not great, but we're improving. Okay. Agreed. All right. When we come back, we're going to talk about the people's house and access to it. NC Spin will return after these messages. It's a fact. Patients who receive care in the medical home from a trusted family physician reduce health care costs through prevention, early detection, and affordable management of high cost chronic diseases. Every dollar invested in health care matters. Let's invest them wisely. Building on North Carolina's medical home model, better health begins with a medical home, a trusted family physician the best return on our health care investment. Learn about the importance of medical homes at OurNCHealthcare.com. Where do you go when you need to know? ANC makes it easy for you to get the information you need to make well-informed public policy decisions. Our members are industry leaders who are ready to share their industry-specific insights with you. Want to hear both sides of the story? ANC members can tell you. Just use the ANC member directory as your guide or call us directly. ANC members have the knowledge, expertise, and perspective you need to create public policies that are good for North Carolina. We are ready for your call. One in five North Carolinians can't buy healthy foods in their communities, increasing their risk of obesity, diabetes, heart disease, stroke, and some forms of cancer. Learn more at accesshealthyfoodsnc.org. We now return to NC Spin. The 2013 session of the General Assembly was distinctive for Moral Monday protests leading to approximately a thousand arrests when legislative police term determined demonstrators were disturbing the legislative process. Following loud protests that legislative leaders were being too arbitrary, a committee of ten lawmakers met and updated the rules, which Representative Ten Moore from Kings Mountain said balanced the public's right of access with the legislature's ability to conduct its business. Senator Josh Stein responded to the new rules by saying, it's deeply concerning we're changing the rules in which the people can enter the people's house. It was done without any public comment or any opportunity for this full chamber to consider these roles, rules. Moore replied, it's the most open building in state government and will continue to be the most open building in state government. Chris. It's a legitimate question, though. How do you balance the public's right of access to what's historically been called the people's house with the legislature's ability to be able to conduct business? Well, the first thing you do is you let the public and other legislators have some input. I mean, I think Senator Stein is on to one thing here, which is the process by which these rules were, were, uh, were adopted. That would have gone a long way if they would have let people talk, if they would have let other senators talk and maybe debate it, because this is a very interesting uh, time we are when we have big protests, 1,500 people there on the first Monday of the session. Uh, nobody wants to, uh, nobody doesn't think the General Assembly should be able to do their work. I think some of these rules have far too much discretion. What happened last year, people, people wanted to be arrested, they were arrested. Uh, the General Assembly didn't seem to have a good handle on it. There were actually also people arrested last year who were in the building watching the protests. I know some of them who were standing far away who were just rest, uh, arrested because they said they had to leave the General Assembly, the, the public, the, which is a public building. The back uh, absolutely. Yeah. Joe, you, you've been House Speaker before. <laughs> you've, you've had people uh, groups that have come into the, the chambers and come into the building when you were trying to conduct business. What's your take on all this? Well, first of all, uh, in the 15 years that I served in the House, I never heard the term the people's house. I think it's something recent and I think it's, it's uh, fuzzy logic. 
The second thing is, if we have the people's houses, the General Assembly, well, do we have the people's capital? Well, to get in there, you have to have an ID. Well, how about the people's Supreme Court building? Well, to get in there, you've got to have an ID. Uh, do we have the people's horse arena? Uh, I think it's foolish. I think Senator Stein gets an A for pandering. He's not served a single day in the Senate under rules that had any public input. Interesting. John, what's your take on all this? Well, first of all, there is a great deal of posing for the cameras, not just the <laughs> protesting, but the complaints about the rules. Now, I can't disagree that it would be better to have had some consultation, not that, as Joe said, it's ever really been done in the past either. But these rules, for the most part, are quite reasonable. And I don't think it helps the protest movement at all to be complaining and having this ridiculous, you know, tape on the mouth protest about how they can't yell and shout. And, you know, it reminds me of the liberals I used to argue with when I was on campus back in the 80s of Carolina. And they were these great champions of free speech. And their definition of free speech is, I hold an event and they come and yell my speaker down. That's their definition of free speech. I'm not very impressed by this kind of pandering talk. Becky, uh, wow. <laughs> last week we had the, the, the Moral Monday protesters. They taped their mouths. Uh, Reverend William Barber said they weren't doing it because they were complying. They were doing it as a symbolic gesture that the legislature was trying to shut them up. Uh, it, it, was that the case? I, I heard that as well. It, that is a little bit of a puzzle to me as well. If anybody has gotten coverage over this, it is the Moral Monday group and Reverend Barber. I mean, the media, they are on the front page of the newspaper. It seems to me that on three days before the, set, the Mondays, the press is talking about what are they going to do, what are they going to do, what are they going to do. There's full coverage on Monday, and then the next three days they talk about what they did and what they're going to do the next three days. So anybody that says that they aren't being heard isn't paying attention. We're talking about it on this show. We've talked about it before on this show, and it's in every newspaper and on every radio show. All right, well, we're, we're going to... Uh, my column, by the way, this week is on this, and Joe, I have heard it called the People's House for many years, and, and I think everybody needs to remember that everybody there is a visitor. No one is much more than just a guest in the People's House of North Carolina. We'll talk about that more at another time. After these messages, we're going to ask the panel to tell us something we don't know. NC Spin is brought to you in part by the North Carolina Farm Bureau. The Farm Bureau and Agriculture. We keep North Carolina growing. Does your North Carolina business or organization have a story to tell? I'm Richard Campbell, and at Carolina Broadcasting and Publishing, we help tell stories that connect you to the people who will respond. We take the time to understand our clients' needs and what makes them unique. We craft their stories through the efficient use of words, images, and videos that resonate with their desired audience. We also know that a good story is incomplete without a call to action. On video, on air, online, and in print, from concept to final production, no one can help tell your story more effectively or affordably than we can. For special introductory offers, visit carolinabroadcasting.com or call 919-832-1416. Again, that's carolinabroadcasting.com. Let us help tell your story today. CON laws were reformed and we had more choice and control to help our patients arrive at a better outcome faster. That's the goal for everybody. And having more choices, it invariably would provide quicker access, control of the quality of images, which is a big difficulty. And most importantly, being able to have competition for price controlling ultimately translates to less dollars by the patient. I am Dr. Sean Hawker and I support certificate of need reform. I'm Linda Loveland. Join me for a special screening of Farmland, a documentary that takes us inside the lives of six young farmers and ranchers. It's an eye-opening look into their high-risk jobs and their passion for a way of life passed down for generations but is constantly evolving. This special screening of Farmland will be June 12th at the Carolina Theater in Durham. Five dollars from every ticket will help feed hungry neighbors. Get your tickets now at FeedTheDialogueNC.com. Now it's our favorite part of the show. We ask our panel to tell us something we don't know. 
John Hood, we'll start with you. Tom, a private security company called SafeWise recently did a, a study of all the communities in North Carolina. They ranked the top 50 safest communities in North Carolina. Half of them were in the Triangle area or in the Charlotte environs. Not Charlotte, which isn't very safe, but the towns around it. Interestingly, only five of our safest communities in North Carolina are east of I-95. So yet another problem in eastern North Carolina is unfortunately relatively high crime, which actually depresses the economy. Wow. Becky, tell us something we don't know. In this year's regulatory reform bill, there's a provision to lift a ban on cussing on highways in North Carolina. When that bill was originally put into place, there was one legislator who filed an amendment who felt like there ought to be someplace safe in North Carolina that you could cuss if you felt the need. So in the original legislation, there is an exemption for Swain County and Pitt County. So there is some place in the eastern part of the state and the western part of the state that if you are inclined to cuss on a highway, you can do it. Go there and do it. You've got 30 seconds, Judd. Uh, <clears throat> Sheriff Donnie uh, Harrison in 2004 set up a citizen's well check program for seniors who are by themselves and 65 got a phone, have somebody that will handle an emergency call and deputies will go to the house to make sure they're okay. Chris, I got 10 seconds. I'm sorry. Uh, there's some folks in the Department of Revenue, longtime employees that believe the tax cut will be will cost more than the governor has allocated in his budget. We're going to have some problems late in the year. Well, you've heard our spin on the issues of the day. To stay informed all during the week, give your feedback and read our weekly column. Visit ncspin.com or catch us on Facebook and we hope you'll join us next week when we take on more issues of interest to the people of North Carolina. Until then, happy Memorial Day, stay informed, and watch out for the spin. Join us next week and get the spin on issues facing our state.